Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. Hey, I hope everyone is having a great holiday season. And if you aren't, hey, you know what? I totally understand. I know sometimes the holidays can be very difficult times for some people. Some people suffer from a lot of either seasonal depression or uh, the, the pressure of just all of the things that we're supposed to do during this time can get to a lot of people. So if you aren't doing well right now, uh, just take care of yourself and try to have at least a couple good days. Try to do, I don't know, just, just do one good thing for yourself every day over the next week. Uh, that's one thing that I learned from my grandma. My grandma was my favorite person who ever lived. And she said that she tried to do something fun in her life every single day, whether that was something big or small. And that is one kind of philosophy that I do try, try, to, uh, try to live out as much as possible. But uh, this video today is going to be the only video for this week. I think for the next two weeks, there's only going to be one video a week, maybe two. Uh, coming up soon, we will do the 2023 year in review for the Dungeon Dive. We'll take a look back at 2023, talk about uh, the channel in general, uh, with things going forward. And then we'll also discuss my favorite games of the year, my favorite gaming experiences of the year. But in this episode, we are going to return back to Mork Manual, the fantasy, more traditional fantasy themed kind of re-implementation uh, for Mork Borg and kind of go into an adventure, do a very, very casual kind of let's play, uh, focusing on a few different things. So I did kind of change things up a little bit. We are still going to be using parts of the Valley of Forbidden Churches for this adventure, but I'm also going to be using the Gardens of Yen. And this is a supplement that I've had for quite a while. It is kind of a kind of a famous supplement, an OSR supplement created by Emmy Allen. I got this on Drive-Thru RPG and just printed my own. I think at one time there were physical editions out there, but I think by the time I knew of this, all the physical editions were gone. So, but I was able to get a, a, a PDF and anybody can buy a PDF. And I thought I've had this for a while and I thought it would actually be a really good companion piece, uh, a really good setting to use for Mork Manual. And Gardens of Yin is kind of a, it's a point crawl system where you generate random locations and encounters through these very strange and otherworldly gardens of yin. And it's really interesting. It has a lot of cool stuff going for it. Now, one thing that the gardens of yin does kind of require that I am basically going to ignore, at least the details of, is keeping track of time. Uh, I'm not a big fan of keeping track of time in games. It's one of my least favorite kind of uh, book keeping things. And I know it can be important, especially for uh, keeping track of rations. And if you have any kind of survival mechanisms going on, it is important to at least keep track of days. And so we are going to kind of abstract the timekeeping rules of Gardens of Yen into uh, different periods of a day. And we'll go over that in a minute. But I did have a little bit of a backstory written for this adventure. I was trying to think of some, some thematic reasons why my character, my character Tanner Lee and his vagabond. So he is a he is a fallen, he's a relic finder for the southern sect of the bog monks. And his companion here is Jambo. And Jambo is a vagabond. And so Jambo isn't a full-fledged character. I think of him more as a utility character. Uh, sometimes when you're playing solo, one of the hardest things is for one character to cover all of the bases, all of the things you need. You know, um, famously, you know, sword and sorcery characters like Fawford and Grey Mouser and, and, and Conan, Conan especially. Conan was a great warrior. Conan was a great thief. Conan was a great diplomat, or he, he at least could be politically savvy when he needed to be. Uh, Conan could basically do everything that he needed to do to overcome the challenges presented to him. But in a game, especially when you're starting with a low level character, you know, you can't be Conan. You can't have all of your bases covered. And so with a solo character, I often like to play with a utility character. And this character will just kind of help out. 
so I chose that Jambo, his uh, little sidekick here would be a, a Vagabond and the Vagabonds in Mork Manual are basically your thieves. And so he can do things like, like finding and setting off traps, disarming traps, climbing, hiding, move silently, pick locks and things like that. But uh, let me get uh, the little uh, backstory here and I will read that now. Tanner Lee, Fallen, Relic Hunter and Glorified Errand Boy for the Southern Sect of the Bog Monks, along with his Vagabond companion Jambo, have royally screwed up. They were tricked, hoodwinked, and made fools of by a local master thief, the great Zago. Zago sabotaged the Southern Sect of Bog Monks' supply of grum, lacing it with an intensely strong sleeping po uh, poison, thus knocking out Tanner, Jambo, and the entire sect of bog monks. Once all were rendered useless, snoring away, Zago casually walked into the monastery and stole Clark's crown, a purple velvet sack of holding. But what was Clark's crown holding? What was so important? The southern sect of the Bog Monks worship an entity known on this plane of existence as Haga Korem. Haga Korem offers to his followers a life in which all of their physical and mental needs are taken care of. Those who follow and worship Haga Korem live a life of relative ease and leisure. All Haga Korem demands is that his followers become soulless. The devout must relinquish and destroy their own souls, thus damning them to a wretched eternity after death in exchange for an easy life in the here and now. However, the southern sect of the Bog Monks staunchly reject the idea of an afterlife, so this seems like a good trade-off. How they reconcile that with the existence of a soul and a god is best left for the religious scholars and apologists to argue and write about. Here's where it went from bad to worse for Tanner and Jambo. Protecting Clark's crown was the most important part of the job they were hired for. The southern sect of the Bog Monks thought they could pull one over on old Haga Korim. Each member of the sect transferred his soul into a small metal sphere known as a soul sphere. No bigger than a crocket ball, the 72 soul spheres were easily stashed away in Clark's crown, which, is all, which also had the ability to completely hide its contents from all prying eyes, both mortal and immortal. The monks could, at any time, easily retrieve their souls from the bag. They weren't really giving anything up in exchange for what their god offered. However, it was also quite hypocritical because they claimed to not believe in the afterlife. But hey, those kinds of uh, that that kind of dichotomy there is is pretty common in these kinds of wacky religions, right? So enter Zago. Zago was hired by the southern sect of the Bog Monk's most competitive rival, the First Church of the Hidden Path. Zago was hired to retrieve Clark's crown, bring it to the First Church of the Hidden Path, located somewhere in the fabled Silver City. After which, the master monk of the Hidden Path, a pathetic creature called Krunt, would reveal to Haga Korem that the Bog Monks hadn't truly given up their souls, a transgression for which Haga Korem would severely punish the Bog Monks. And so it is up to Tanner Lee and Jambo to retrieve Clark's crown and return the Bag of Holding to the Southern Sex Monastery. A few questions to ask myself while I am playing. Does Tanner know what is in Clark's crown? Uh, what happens when the truth is revealed to Haga Korem? What kind of deity is Haga Korem? Why does the First Church of the Hidden Path hate the Southern Sect of the Bog Monks so much? So just a couple little things to keep in mind. Who knows if I'll remember those things to keep in mind because forgetting things is one of my, uh, one of my superpowers. But uh, so yeah, so the first part of this adventure is going to be going through the Gardens of Inn. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to video the entire adventure. We might kind of truncate bits and pieces of it and move around a little bit. We'll see how it goes. I have no idea how this is going to go at all. I haven't rehearsed or practiced or, or anything. It could be an absolute disaster. But uh, so we will explore the gardens. Now the gardens are explored in a point crawl system, and as you move down, as you move deeper and deeper into the gardens, you start getting into more and more kind of interesting and maybe dangerous locations. The final location for the adventure when you're running it normally usually is the ruins of Yin, and you try to get you maybe have a goal of getting there uh, in your exploration. 
and that is at a roll of 35 or higher on a d20. Now, how do you roll 35 or higher on a d20? Each level you go down, you add one to your exploration roll of a d20. And so you would maybe have to be down at level 15 or more in order to even discover the uh, the, the ruins of Yin. And the ru and, and Yin is uh, the gardens of Yin are, are constantly shifting and morphing in uh, the, the the way that you play this game. And so you never really know what you're going to find, and you don't need to roll up anything beforehand because it's a it's a randomly generated point crawl. Uh, so I am saying that I'm trying to find a settlement within the Gardens of Yin, and the settlement is at uh, 29. So I need to finally roll a 29 or higher on my search, on my location search roll on a d20, adding in any of my depths that I have gone down to find that settlement. And then once I find that settlement, maybe something will happen there, and that settlement will actually lead to the Demon Worm Tunnels. And the Demon Worm Tunnels are found in the Valley of the Forbidden Church. And this is kind of more of a dungeon crawl here. And in this little zine here in the Demon Worm Tunnels, there is a D66 table of encounters that you can have in these tunnels, which uh, sound pretty interesting. And then within these tunnels, there are these uh, A, B, C, and D. One of these locations will finally lead to the Silver City. And this is kind of my final goal here, where Zago, the Master Thief, has taken Clark's crown, the bag of holding, either to Groxum's palace or Slosser's palace. So I'm not sure which, but I need to get to one of those to retrieve, to retrieve that bag. And so that's kind of like the entire adventure there. So explore the gardens, locate the tunnels, locate the Silver City. That is what we are trying to do. Okay, so using solitary defilement as kind of a guide here, the first thing you want to do is we are beginning our adventure and you want to set up how many milestones this adventure is going to be. And a milestone uh, is used for getting better for leveling up. So I'm going to say that this adventure has two milestones. The first milestone is going to be uh, locating the demon worm tunnels. Once that is done, that is one milestone. And the second milestone will be determining which of the uh, two towers Zago has taken the bag of holding to. So we are going to have a two milestone adventure. And so that is, let's see here, two milestone. That is annoying. So annoying. This uh, adventure is annoying. With two milestones. That's important for two reasons. I stated the first one just a minute ago, and that has to do with leveling up, with getting better, the progress system, the character uh, progression system in Mork Borg and Mork Manual. And it also will determine how you complete your, how you conclude the adventure. Because at the end of that adventure, once we have done our two milestones, then we roll to see if this adventure has been concluded or not. And that will be on a DR check of a 10, uh, so you roll a, D, a 2d20 plus your omens. So you'll take your d20 if you have, let's say I had one omen and uh, seven and a 12. So the highest is 12 plus one is 13. So I would have uh, beaten that dr total of 10. So that means that the adventure was completed and now it would be time to start another one. Or you could have a failure, which would mean that you have to add more milestones. So some kind of uh, twist has happened in your adventure and you need to continue adventuring. So we have two milestones with the first locate the demon worm tunnels and two locate the tower and the bag of holding. So my character here, we went over the character in uh, the last episode. And one thing that I always like to do in Morkborg is assign one of the unheroic feats to my new characters. Uh, these unheroic feats, you can roll, I believe it's a D66 roll, and those are found in the Heretic. The Heretic, you can, I believe you can still find physical copies of this on, on Amazon and on eBay. I think that's where I got mine. But you can also get uh, copies on drive through RPG. But these are just uh, kind of additional things that your character can do. 
And I like to use these as kind of, a, a, of another way of adding powers to my character. But I rolled up here on 43 Inspired Storyteller. So your tales bring joy and smiles to everyone around you, even in the bleakest of times. All of it is lies, of course, but who cares? So I can test presence of a DR9 whenever resting to weave a compelling tale. I can increase the difficulty rating of that for every additional audience member and success allows everyone to gain an omen. So I don't know if that will come into, uh, I don't know if that'll, that, that'll come into play here, but, uh, but we will see. And so of course, omens are ways that you can uh, mitigate luck and I have, or mitigate bad luck. And I have two omens right now. I have two powers per day. My powers are bestial speech, which is a, which is a lesser priest scroll from Mork Manual, and this will allow me to communicate with beasts. And that might actually come in really handy in Gardens of Yen. I'm also graceless and I can trip the light. Trip the light is a kind of a fury, a flurry of blows. So if I uh, make an attack, I can keep attacking until I miss that kind of thing. And uh, graceless, what was graceless again? Graceless is on page 21 here. Let's see. Graceless is, yeah, at the start of combat, I can expend a power and make the first attack. So I can kind of ignore initiative. So that's one thing that I can do here. Okay, let's see. I also wanted to show you guys uh, some dice that a company called, what were they called? Uh, they were called Gatekeeper Games. So Gatekeeper Games sent me some GM dice that are really cool. And I wanted to feature those uh, real quick before we get going here. And I think these are pretty handy. A lot of people might really like these, especially for solo play. They're not specifically made for solo play, but I think they're pretty good. So you have a number of different dice here and they're kind of paired off. But we have uh, dice where you can roll up your weather. And so we'll be using this every day within the Gardens of Yen. We'll roll up for different weather. Weather is pretty mild in the Gardens of Yin, but it's also unpredictable. And so we can use this. So you have everything from bright and overcast, stormy, sunny, fair, and so on. Really cool. We also have a die here to determine NPC, uh, reaction NPC, kind of how they will react to you when you come across them. They can be benevolent, welcoming, pleasant, busy, available, uh, miserable, angry, uninterested. A really nice die there. I like this one quite a bit. So these 2d12 dice here are good for dungeon crawling. We have a loot die. So if you need to determine what kind of loot you have found, everything from, from a hoard where you can roll uh, three times on a loot chart, a medium loot, medium loot, a chest, you can roll twice, a uh, large loot. So a cool d12 there. Uh, this d12 is a trap die. And so you can roll everything from no trap to a snare trap, poison trap, sonic, uh, lightning, fire, cold, crush. So really cool uh, trap die. And then we also have this die, uh, these pairings here, which are for encounters. So you can easily roll up how difficult your encounter is from something being easy to hard to no encounter to uh, uh, finding different persons. And then also you can roll up what they, how they react to uh, your presence. They can maybe try to avoid you. They might try to attack you. Uh, maybe they try, they're unaware, or they are uh, an ambush attack, a surprise attack, un, unresponsive, uninterested, I should say. Or maybe they are attacking. So you can roll those together to have no encounter. All right, so no encounter or you can have a medium difficult encounter and they are going to attack us outright. So those might come in handy. We also have a critical hit die here, which uh, the critical hit die has all different kinds of things where you can damage their weapon. Uh, this is, you can dismember a part of their body, uh, location and numbered, so a, or numbed I should say, where you can roll up on a location die and then that location gets numbed. Now you can stun them. You can apply minor penalties. So all kinds of different things for different types of uh, critical hits. And then finally, we have these location dice for attacking. So this is for humanoids. So head, arms, legs, uh, torso, and then also a uh, special there. And then we also have a location die for beasts. And these are like kind of maybe more like quadrupeds where you have torso, necks, uh, arms, tails, and so on. 
And then if you want to get even more granular, this D10 here will tell you uh, where on that location it hits, if it's lower or upper or central. So if you just needed something to, to come up with a random location, you could roll these dice. So yeah, these are pretty cool. I like them. They're really chunky and really well-made dice. They feel, they feel really good. They feel really, really hefty. So if you're looking for some good hefty dice to maybe roll up some random things, you might want to check into those GM assist dice from, uh, from Gatekeeper Games. But uh, let's see here. All right. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to roll up our initial location. So we are entering into the Gardens of Yen. We have we have been tasked by our our order. The uh, the, the, the main monk of the southern sect of the bog monks has uh, said, hey, you know, you guys need to go and get Clark's bag of holding uh, back from uh, wherever it is we have heard a rumor that 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 zago is taking it to the silver city and so we have located a garden within our monastery we have a garden and to enter into the gardens of yen all you have to do is find a garden and you have to draw on a wall or someplace in the garden you have to draw a door and say yen by way of the monastery and then a door will appear and we can enter into yen and we need to find out where our first location is. But before we do that, of course, we have to roll up on our power, our, roll up on our prophecies to see uh, how close the world is to ending in uh, Mork Manual here. And we're going to start with a D20. So we'll roll our D20 here. And oh my God, a 20. Okay, so we have our, our very first prophecy has already come to fruition. All right, so let's see here. We have the prophecy. Prophecy of the Dark Lord. We have our first one here. So that will be a D66 here. Actually, we'll, uh, we'll use the one and we'll roll a, six, a D6 here. Let's see what our first prophecy is. Okay, so a 1-6. The Dark Lord sunders time. The sun rises every 12 hours and all beings languish in half-life of the world. Okay, so we are one step closer to this world of this campaign of this campaign being destroyed. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. And one was one, six, and that was on a D20. So our next roll will be on a D12. Okay. I'm also using, I don't like keeping track of individual rations and lantern and water and so on. So I'm using a usage die system, starting with a D8 for rations, a D6 for my lantern, and a D6 for uh, Jambo's torch, as well as my water skin on a D6. But I am playing uh, the upper two values. So if we roll a seven and an eight, a five or a six, then we will go down to the next uh, die. So the D8 will descend down to a D6, then a D4, the D6 down to a D4, and so on. And then we will have to take some time within the gardens to search for some supplies. The nice thing about the Gardens of Ian is that it is pretty easy to find the kinds of supplies you need. It is a verdant area. There's lots of greenery, lots of water. Uh, these gardens, while somewhat deserted they also are overgrown and there's a lot of there's a lot of of life maybe not sentient life maybe not intelligent life but a lot of life within the gardens of yen so let's all roll up and see where we enter into the gardens of yen on this first excursion so when you enter into a location you have three choices you can stay in that location you can go deeper or you can go back and uh, going deeper or going back takes an exploration turn and a turn is about 10 minutes. And so if you were keeping track of time like you should in the Gardens of Yen because the doorway out closes after 24 hours, but we are not worried about that exit. We are descending into the Gardens of Yen looking for that settlement in order to find uh, an alternate exit through the Demon Worm Tunnel. So we're just kind of... Uh, we're not using the rules as written for Gardens of Yin. But the first, there are four steps. We will roll for a location. We will roll for the details. We will roll for events. A D20 if we are not camping. A D12 if we are camping. And then we will roll for a clue. And the clues are things that I am trying to find that will also help us locate those settlements. 
and I have a little oracle, a little chart to roll up on a D4 to see if there is a clue that we can possibly find in that location that will point us towards that silver city. So the first thing we do is roll up our location for where we enter the gardens. That is a D20 and that is a four. So let's see our location here. We come into an orchard. Okay, so we will write orchard here. So this is at level zero. And let's see what the weather is like here and within the orchard when we enter the gardens of Yin. It's a nice sunny day. Okay, so sunny. So the uh, days here, we will separate into four different. So a day is actually 48 hours within the Gardens of Yin. And we're going to separate that into four phases. We are exploring during the day. And then we have a camp and survival uh, phase. And then we are exploring at night with a camp and survival phase. And then back to number one, back to exploring during the day. And when we come back to number one, we have to eat one of our rations. So we have started this first day where you need to eat one of our rations. So let's roll our usage die on a D8 to see if our rations go down. And it is a four. So we have plenty of rations. So we eat for the day. And so we are OK. And I'm saying that during each exploration phase, I can explore about six locations, maybe four to six locations, depending on how detailed they get. OK, so we come across an orchard. Now, let's see what the details of this orchard are, because these details here, they modify the locations. And so even if you play this game multiple times, you will have different details for each of the 35 different locations. And that's pretty cool. And so then again, this is a D20 plus depth. We're at zero. So this is a four. And so we find that they are well maintained. OK, so let's read about our orchards now. One of the main criticisms, maybe the only criticism I have of Gardens of Yen, because this is mostly a fantastic point crawl system, lots of great detail, lots of awesome things, but it is a little cumbersome to use because it doesn't give you the page numbers for your locations or your details or even your bestiary at, on the charts that you are rolling. You have to go back to your table of contents to find those uh, locations where they are in the book. And what's worse is once you get to the locations section or the details section or the bestiary section, the uh, the various locations, the various details aren't in alphabetical order. So it makes finding what you're looking for a little more difficult than it needs to be. But the orchard was right at top here. So here we have our orchard and we found uh, fruit trees spaced out every few yards coppiced. So their so their branches start five feet above the ground trunks now gnarled and grizzled with age branches extending into a tangled canopy that ends 50 feet up fruit no longer harvest uh, drop to the floor where they rot and ferment. This place stinks of alcohol. Just breathing here is intoxicating. On entering, we have to save versus poison. On a failure, one damage each turn you remain. Fruit still on the branch is perfectly edible. OK, so let's see what our uh, location details of well-maintained is. Unlike most other parts of the gardens, this area is perfectly preserved. Uh, Metalwork isn't rusty. Stone isn't eroded. The grass is neatly mowed and the hedges clipped and flowers are in straight rows. But there is also this kind of poison. So the ground has this uh, fermenting kind of alcohol poison that is just just below the water table is poisonous in this uh, well maintained orchard. So we'll write well maintained. with Poison. And now we will roll a D4 to see if, if possibly there is a clue here that we can find that will help us locate our our objective here. Uh, search for a clue. So we'll roll a D4 to see if there is possibly a clue here. And it is a four. No. OK, so we don't need to waste any time searching for a clue in this orchard. We do need to test poison and we will do that on a test of a I believe that's a toughness test. OK, so that is a toughness test. But if you remember my character, Tanner Lee, he is immune to poison. He has a power of, of immunity of um, he is 
immortal. So fall and die from beheading, stabbing, blunt force trauma, and blood loss, but never disease, infection, poisons. You are immune to them. So I don't need to worry about that poison. Hey, that came in handy. But uh, Jambo here, he might have to worry about this poison. And so that is a, what did I say, a toughness roll. We have uh, toughness, resisting disease. So that would be a poison there. Uh, uh, Jambo's toughness is a zero. And so we will need to get a 12 or higher to resist that. And a 15. Okay, so Jambo, he is not affected by the poison either. And so I think we will just press on now. There was no, oh, actually we do need to roll for an encounter. So that's another thing that we need to do. And for the encounters here or for our events, we will roll a d20 to see what happens to us in the orchard. Again, you, do, uh, you don't add your depth here, but we have a four. Uh, something turns up. It's merely curious. Roll for an encounter. Okay, so what do we find here? We're going to add our depth, which is zero. That is an 18. A walking topiary. Okay, so some kind of a walking tree is walking around this orchard. It is merely interested. It maybe uh, appear, approaches us. It's not hostile. And we are just going to ignore it. And we are going to uh, continue moving on. We are going to move deeper. And so to move deeper into the Gardens of Yen, we will draw a line here. And let's see what we have now. So now we are at level one. So we're going to add one to our D20. Okay, a three, so a four. So that is, again, another orchard. So this orchard just continues here. So this is a continuing orchard. So the orchard continues. But now let's see if it has a different kind of detail here. An 18, okay, so the 18 here. It's a glass-roofed orchard. Okay, so let's look up glass-roofed. Where is that uh, details? Glass-roofed, okay, around page 38. I really wish it would have... Uh, put the page numbers on those charts. It would, it would have been just much easier. Maybe I should just go in there and add them. But okay, glass roofed. The whole location is inside a single giant glass house. Okay, so this is kind of a hot house here, glass house. And uh, the climate is slightly warmer and more humid than normal. It's misty and stifling. You're protected from outside weather. One in three encounters here will be with the myconoid composters at night or the rose maidens during the day. Uh, they have settlements here. So we have these. Uh, so we are during the day. Let's say a one in three. So a one, two, or three what are the rose maidens. A three. Okay. So we have, we come across a rose, maize, a rose maiden settlement. Okay, so what's up with this uh, rose maidens here? Let's find the rose maidens. All right, so bestiary here, rose maidens, page 54. As a dryad is to a tree, these creatures are to beds of roses. So these uh, rose maidens, maybe they have started planting their roses in this uh, glass house. Where, these, where this orchard is. Uh, one thing we should do is roll for our poison. Tanner Lee doesn't need to worry about it. Jambo needs to get a 12 or higher on a D12 or D20 and no. So he takes one point of damage here from the poison. I should use a pencil. So we definitely don't want to hang out here, but let's see if the Rose Maidens will um, allow us what is their disposition towards us? Let's uh, roll this die here and see. Amiable. Okay, so the Rose Maidens are just kind of going uh, along with their job. They are planting and tending to their roses. Uh, the Rose Maidens can walk about on their roots. So these are kind of like, uh, they're, they're kind of made out of, topia, out of trees or out of uh, shrubbery. Uh, they talk in high, soft voices where the human voice is a cello, a Rose Maidens is a flute. Okay, they are intelligent as humans. They maintain the sights of particular beauty in the garden. Uh, brushing away dirt and litter and polishing stone and metal like the Mycon composters, Myconid composters, they have their own culture. Okay, they sing as they work. So there's some singing in the air. There's really kind of high-pitched, maybe glass-like, glass, -like, glass uh, 
uh, crystal-like singing that we can hear and we can see these, these uh, rose maidens tending to their roses, cleaning things, being very meticulous in their garden, gardening uh, duties. Uh, their songs hit strange resonant frequencies in the plants around them. By combining frequencies, their harmonies can produce supernatural seeming effects. These songs are also how they train plants to grow in particular patterns. Their homes, elegant uh, bowers of living, wood and leaves are made in this way. So they construct their, their settlement, their dwellings out of the uh the, the plants that they use their songs to make grow in certain patterns very very cool i wonder if we can find out a little bit more about uh, about these let's see here um let's roll up on let's roll up on the horticultural and unusual floral styles of this little settlement of rose maidens and so we have a d20 so a five and an 11, a five. So they are tending to flower beds and there's a lot of moss. So they have these mossy, moss covered dwellings made from flower beds. So maybe we can approach them. They are amiable we can approach them and uh, maybe we can uh, ask them if they're if they know of anything of the Silver City, if they have heard, maybe they saw Zago coming through here and uh, they might be able to help us and we might get a bonus on trying, maybe trying to find a clue. And so let's do a presence test. And I'm pretty good at uh, at communication. You know, I am a fallen. One of my skills is is um, I'm an inspired storyteller. And I'm also enthralling, so I can get a plus three to reaction if I was rolling on the reaction chart. So I'm going to give myself advantage on this. And we are doing a DR12 presence test to see how our how our communication goes with the Rose Maidens here. And okay, so an 18. All right, so or 16. So I talk to them and I express my concern that I'm trying to find this thief who might have come through here. Uh, they said that maybe they heard a rumor about a thief coming in and uh, that will give us, let's say that'll give us a plus one on our clue roll here. So we'll roll our D4 and a three, actually a minus one because I somehow made one the good. So that way, that's a two here on our, on, I need to, I should probably switch those uh, around, but um, a three, so it's one better. So a two. So yes, there is a clue here, but, uh, but it is being uh, the 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 plants have grown around the clue. And so I need to convince maybe there's some footprints, maybe the Zago, maybe he dropped something. Uh, but the Rose Maidens have have caused the shrubbery to grow over the clue, the area where I think there might be something. So I need to try to convince them to let me uh, to let me kind of uh, pull up these roots around this one little area to see if I can uh, find it. So let's see if I can convince them. Again, that's a DR12 presence test and a 17. Yes. Okay. So I do convince them and I find the clue. I find something that Zago dropped or some kind of a mess he made and I'm able to now have one clue. So now we can always add a plus one to the roll for locations, which means that we will have a better chance of finding that settlement. So we'll keep track of our clues here. Our clues at plus one. Okay, so I think I'm going to actually uh, rest for the night here. And uh, that will be the first phase. So that is our first exploration phase. So now we are coming into our camp slash survival phase. And we don't really need to uh, have any kind of survival. We're good. We have enough rations. We have enough water. Um, I will take a rest so I can uh, heal a D4. So uh, Jambo will heal one of his HP. Because in resting in Mork Manual here, we do have... I think Mork Manual has some different, uh, uh, better abilities for resting, or you have uh, you have better chances of just of getting better while you rest here. And so resting is on page fifty one. Let me take a look here. So this is a full rest. 
this is our first uh, our first phase of resting here. And uh, a full night's rest heals D6 HP, sleep on a bed. If we're not sleeping on a bed, we're sleeping within the uh, Rose Maiden settlement. So it might be a little uncomfortable. There might be like some thorns and sticks and stuff, but uh, we will take them up on their, hospita <laughs> on their hospitality there. But we do need to have an encounter at night to see what happens. So we do need to roll a D12 on this encounter chart in here. All right, so a D12 and eight. So let's see what we find here. D8 encounters, and this is uh, this is during the daytime, and so our next our next exploration and our next camp phase will be during the nighttime. So we have a daytime. Uh, the depth is one, so we have a nine. So we have a golem gardener. Okay, so this golem gardener is uh, approaches us. Perhaps the golem gardener is being controlled by the rose maidens. Uh, let's read a little bit about the golem gardener and see uh, see what it says here. Gollum Gardener, an artificial being made of elegantly carved hard wood. Wood joined together, lacquered and polished, makes a soft clicking of wood on wood when it moves. Dedicated to maintaining the garden. Plants, trees, prunes, weeds, dredges, ponds. Uh, displays a tender care for the plants, insects, and birds it looks after. A gentle giant, almost maternal in its nurturing. Implacable in its cold fury against anything that would harm the gardens, does not speak, simply moves weeds and uh, simply removes weeds and vermin. So we got permission from the Rose Maidens to, to pull up those roots to find that clue. And so I would say, I would play this, that the Golem Gardener is working for the Maidens. They, they the Rose Maidens themselves, have made the, uh, have made the, the Golem to do their bidding. And so we do not need to worry about it attacking us. We are under the protection of the Rose Maidens in their settlement for this uh, for this evening. OK, so now we can go on to our nighttime exploration phase. So I, I played this where this was one location and then this location, because we were with the Rose Maidens for some time, we were looking for a clue. Uh, that that would take up the entire uh, exp the first exploration phase. I'm just kind of playing it playing it loose with time here. But our next location, we will continue to go deeper. So now we are going to add two. So this is level one and level two. So let's see what location we have here. 11, okay, so 11, so we're adding two, so that's 13. We find a glass, oops, wrong chart there, location 13, the kennels. Okay, so some canine creatures, probably. So we have our kennels. We'll add two for the details. Two, uh, four, well-maintained. I'm going to roll something different because we've already had that. Um, 15 plus two is 17. They are singing. So there's singing in the kennels. So let's look up our kennels here. Little wooden shacks that once housed various beasts and birds of the garden, now abandoned and falling to ruin. Roll twice for events each turn here. Things still knows about. Okay, so we need to roll two events. So we'll roll two events here. It's a little uh, reminder there. And now what, what was the detail? The detail was singing. Uh, 15 was 17 here. So singing on the details. 38. Yeah, I really need to go in. I need to go in and write in the page numbers for all of these because uh, I'm really surprised that the actual details aren't in alphabetical order. It just seems like a real missed opportunity. It seems like just because, especially because this is meant to be played on the fly. The GM is meant to be rolling these, not planning anything. And so having to stop to look things up every single time is kind of annoying. But singing. Okay, so musical. Music filters through the area softly, like droning church organs, whale song, uh, theremins attempting Gregorian chants. The source is a set of gold tubes, six inches thick. So we have these gold tubes emitting this kind of uh, singing here. Okay, so gold tube singing, gold tubes singing. 
All right. So listening to the music promises to grant the listener Yinian insight. Although filtered through synthetic psychedelia, each turn spent doing nothing but listen allows the listener to ask the GM a single question. The GM rolls a D10 to determine the list of possible answers and then picks the most appropriate one. Okay, so I will spend this turn singing and then we will roll for two events. So I am going to uh, kind of ponder asking the GM, asking the universe, asking the question of the singing voices. Am I on the right path to the Silver City? And now let's roll a d10. Okay, a three. We have wind, rain, snow, sunshine, thunder, fog, and clouds. Okay, so that sounds pretty ominous. And so I would interpret that as our way is colluded by uh, sunshine. Is I'm going to say it, the most most of things are, are are pretty bad. Wind, rain, thunder, fog, clouds. Those are things that can um, they can stymie travel. They can be a hardship during travel. And so I am not on the the right path. And so the singing voices tell me that I need to go back to the orchards and then continue from the orchards to another area on level two. The way I am on now is a dead end. And so that is kind of my clue. And I forgot I did have a clue, so I actually should have added a plus one to that roll. We're not gonna worry about it. I've already written all of this stuff there. We will remember to do that on the next. Uh, I should have my clues written on this map sheet so I don't forget them. Clues one. So that's going to be a plus one to our roll there, our location roll. All right, so we're good there. We'll just keep playing like that. So we do have our kennels. We do have this singing, this sing song golden uh, coming, this noise coming from these golden tubes, this synthetic noise. But we do need to roll twice on our events. So let's roll our first event here. Four. Something turns up. It's merely curious. Roll for an encounter. So let's see what kind of encounter here. This is just a curious encounter. Some things strolling through. A 19 plus two is a 21. Um, we have a choir of 2D4 Rose Maidens. Oh, this is cool. Okay, so a choir of Rose Maidens. So these Rose Maidens here, they heard the sing song noise coming from these golden tubes. And the choir came down here to join in the song of the Garden of Yin. And so we are being treated to this great kind of performance of these uh, this synthetic noise accompanied by these flute like voices of the Rose Maidens. It's a really beautiful sight. And let's see what a choir is. I don't know if a choir has a different uh, entry. Choir of Rose Maidens is just the typical Rose Maidens. So a choir just comes down. We've already established a relationship with them, so we don't need to worry about uh, doing anything with them. We are just listening. They are calming. It's kind of a spiritual experience, this kind of uh, new wave performance or new age performance in this uh, in the Gardens of Yen. Kind of a perfect serendipitous moment here that we're having. Uh, let's roll up for our second event. That is a three. Something, something turns up and it is hostile. Roll for the encounter. Okay, so something doesn't like the singing. Something maybe is trying to sleep. And so let's see what we come across here. A 13 plus the depth is two. So 13, 15, an animate statue. Okay, so let's look up this animate statue here. An animate statue, uh, page 51. A statue that moves about beautifully carved from marble worth 300 gold if the body is recovered. It's vague and uncertain, not quite human intelligence, not quite animal. It is senile, 35 hit points, and armor is plate, immune to fire, uh, electricity, or immune to uh, fire, cold, electricity, immune to poison and sickness, maximum of one damage from weapons other than magical weapons or blunt metal weapons, 50%. A uh, chance to ignore any spell. Roll to see what it's made out of. 17. It's made out of a unicorn. Interesting. So it's kind of this unicorn shaped statue that has come to life and it is annoyed with the singing. And so we need to deal with that. Uh, let's see what it is. It's already hostile. We know it's hostile. So I think we need to try to escape from that. 
with a it's a pretty powerful creature and it comes uh it comes barreling through and we need to escape and so if we turn to solitary defilement here so flee for combat it's at dr 11 plus the number of enemies so it's a dr 12 and our agility is zero here and so let's see and a 14 okay so we are able to escape and so we escape the uh, unicorn statue, the animated statue, and we actually run back to the um, to the orchards here. And then we can continue on from this point. OK, so we'll continue on from here and we will go into another location at level two because uh, the kennels was a dead end. We learned from the supernatural singing voice of the golden tubes and the choir of the Rose Maidens that we were not on the right path. We got some, some kind of divine intervention here. We, we learned something. And so we've moved back to the orchard here, escaping the, uh, the unicorn. But uh, going back to here, we do need to deal with that poison. And so Jambo needs to roll on a 12 up. And Jambo rolls a 19, so he doesn't have to worry about the poison. Tanner Lee is immune to the poison. And so now we will move into a different location on level two. So from level one, we will add one. We will add two for our clue here and six, seven, eight for our location. All right. So location number eight. What do we have here? The hot houses. OK, so we've come down here into the hot houses. Now let's roll up our details. 16, Ivy covered. Okay, let's read about our hot houses here. Let's find that location. Glass buildings that house tropical plants. Now the window panes are cracked and broken and the plants within either died off in an unsympathetic climate or overgrown, uh, have overgrown the place. Regardless of the weather outside, it's warm, dry, and pleasant within. To generate the map, drop a small handful of dice onto some paper. Where a dice lands, draw a hothouse. The cross-section of dice is the floor plan of the glass houses. Each corner on the upper face points to a doorway. D12s are two stories high. D20s are three stories high. Each hothouse contains one of the following. Okay, so I guess I need to make a little... A little uh, sub map here for the hot house. Okay, let's see here. Hot house. We'll take, uh, let's take a couple D6s, a D12, and a D20, and maybe a D4. And this is our map here. Okay, so that's how our hot houses are set up. So we have here, we have our D20. Here we have our D4, D12, D6, and a D6. So this is kind of our area here. Maybe there are pathways connecting the various hot houses. Like so. So I was supposed to uh, look for the number rolled for each one, and I totally, uh, totally botched that. But let's just roll for it. Uh, we'll roll one for the D6. So that is a three. So this hot house has plants with medicinal purposes, D6 doses that heal one EHP. OK, so this has uh, medicinal plants. OK, this D6 here is three uh, more medicinal plants. So we can spend some time possibly uh, harvesting those uh, medicinal plants there. And then now we have a D12. And that is a 12 here. So under the greenery, human skeletons with creepers growing out of their rib cages reanimate when approached. OK, so we have some skeletons in here. We might have to fight some undead. OK, and then this is a D4. So we have a one here. A rare plants worth uh, worth uh, depth D4 plus depth of gold. OK, here we have some rare plants. And that is worth D4 plus depth. So we, we are at depth two. 
six gold each. Okay, and then finally here we have our D20, and that is also a 12 here, so that is also undead. Undead skeletons. Okay, so maybe we come in from the north here and we come into D12 first. And so we do need to face off against some skeletons. And so that would be a, a chance for some combat here. And the skeletons here, it says that they have uh, one hit die. So they're pretty easy. They have four HP. They fight with claws at a plus zero, does D6 damage. They save as fighter undead. So um, Gardens of Yen is keyed for uh, typical OSR. And OSR doesn't necessarily map straight to Mark Pork, so we do have to do a little bit of conversion, but we can easily go to our Mork manual here and find the skeletons here. And the skeleton in Mork manual is, has an HP of four, an armor, skeletal physique, so they have a D2 armor, they have no morale, they attack with a sword of D6, so same as the claw here, D6 damage. They're immune to damage from poison and scrolls that affect biological creatures. Number of appearing, a patrol is D6, guards are 3D6, an army of darkness is 5D100. We're just going to say that there are D4, uh, D4 skeletons in this uh, hothouse here. So there is one skeleton. So one skeleton. We walk in to this uh, this uh, largest hot house, and it's all overgrown and uh, come crawling out of the twisted roots is a skeleton, and his uh, its bones are completely overgrown with vines, and it has vines that have twisted and turned and grown and roots growing up through its skeletal system. So this is kind of, a, it looks like a plant, a plant skeleton creature or something. So we do need to attack it. And so let's see who has advantage here on a one, two or three here. We do have our handy dandy chart here. Initiative on a one, two or three, the enemies go first. Okay, and a two. So the enemies will go first, so they will attack us. So we do need to t make a, a uh, agility test in order to avoid this combat our agility is zero all right so we need to hit a 12 or higher and a 13 okay so we do avoid taking damage from the skeleton so now it is our turn to attack so i play that jambo can't really he doesn't really enter into combat unless we absolutely need it jambo is more of a, of a utility character and he can help with other things okay so it is tanner's turn and i do need to attack the creature and so attacking, I will attack with my short sword, which does uh, d6 damage, and I do get a plus one to this attack for my strength here. And so I need to hit a dr12 or higher, and a 12 plus one is 13, so I do damage to the skeleton. And so the skeleton will save on a d2, and I do d6 damage. So I do six damage, it saves for one, so I do enough damage to outright kill the skeleton. All right, treasure, none. Okay, so no treasure there. So we do kill that skeleton. And then from here, we will move over to here to uh, harvest some of these medicinal plants. And let's see if I even know how to harvest them without damaging them. Because these are kind of alien plants to me. I am not a gardener. I don't know what's going on. I might pull these berries off or whatever and actually damage them. And so let's do a presence test of DR12 to see if I can even figure out how to harvest these plants in this hothouse without damaging them, without ruining their medicinal properties. And a 13, yes. Yeah, so I do, I just, I, I know that I shouldn't uh, crumple the leaves as I'm pulling them off. I use some of my, my knowledge as a relic finder, as a fallen, and I do harvest a number of these. I'm just going to say, um, a D4, so D4 medicinal plants, uh, four. So I have four medicinal plants. So I'm just going to write that here, medicinal plants, and I have four. And those heal one HP each. So that will, that will actually come in handy. Okay, so it'll probably take me the whole day, I would say the rest of this, um, of this uh, exploration phase to, to fully explore the hothouses, but let's also see if we find a clue in one of these areas. 
Um, a two. All right. So what was a two on my cheat sheet here is a yes, but. Okay. So we'll say that the clue is down here and the clue is being protected by D4 plus two skeletons. So three skeletons are protecting a clue. So we need to fight those three skeletons in order to find an additional clue. However, we also need to roll up our encounter for this uh, for this location here or our event, I should say. So as we are exploring, let's see what happens as we are exploring here. Event three, something turns up and it is hostile. So there is something else in this uh, place. So we, we've rolled three quite a few times. I'm actually, I'm for the sake of a variety, I'm going to reroll. A 17, okay, that should be new. A 17, a neat brick pathway is found covered in an arch of thick hedgerow that hides the sky. It leads to an area 1d6 plus one layers deeper. Ah, interesting. So we kind of find a secret path that maybe comes off of this location here. So this is a secret path. Secret path. And this leads to a place that is 1d6 plus one. Is that what that was? 1d6 plus one. So this leads to a place that is six deeper. So that would actually, so since this is a two, this would lead to a place that we will add six to when we go. So we will, if we uh, explore off of that hidden path, we will actually go to like a d8 or d9. We're adding nine to our location. So that would be pretty cool. All right, so that's kind of how Gardens of Yen works. And I would continue exploring until I finally found that settlement. But let's say I did find the settlement and we're just kind of fast forwarding here because I do want to keep this all in, in, in one in one episode here. And so we find the settlement and we find the demon worm tunnels here. And so now we can descend into the demon worm tunnels. And I'm just going to uh, kind of show how I would play that out uh, a little on the more simple side than the Gardens of Yen, not as much looking stuff up. Uh, basically, I would say that I would come into uh, this point here. So put my little meeple there and then I can move a number of hexes. Each hex is 15 minutes. Again, I don't like keeping track of time. So I would just say that I could move uh, maybe move three hexes on a turn and I would have a one in six chance of having some kind of an encounter. And then when I reach these nodes here, then I would roll two D66 rolls in the Valley of Forbidden Churches in order to have more detailed encounters at that at those locations. And then the entrance to the Silver City is either in point A, B, C or D. And depending, I would roll on A, I would probably roll a D6. And if I rolled a one, then I would find it here. If I roll the two, actually, let's just do a D4. If I come to point A or the first point will be a one. Nope, I didn't find it. The second point would be a one or two, three or four, and then so on. And so the final point, if I didn't uh, discover the entrance into the secret city before would be the entrance into the silver city, I should say. Did I say secret city? Uh, secret city was actually a really cool drawing show back in the 80s on public access on PBS. And I loved Secret City with Commander Mark. Man, his mural that he drew with all kinds of weird creatures and inhabitants and, and weird alien landscapes and waterfalls and Martians. I love that stuff so much. I used to watch uh, Secret <laughs> I used to watch Secret City all the time. But let's do an example turn here. So let's say I'm in the demon worm tunnels and I can move three. So one, two, three. I'll just move down here to this node here. First of all, let's see if I have an encounter on a one to a six on a one. Nope. OK, but now I am at a node here. And so on the nodes, you do want to roll up two D66s to see what you have encountered in the demon worm tunnels. OK, so our first encounter here, we'll do uh, pink as tens. So 34. All right, 34. This is an unstable tunnel. Loud noise will cause rocks to fall from the ceiling, affecting D2 random characters. Test agility DR10 or take D12 damage. If this happens, the path forward is blocked. Okay, so we need to be quiet. So hopefully we don't have any kind 
of, uh, of combat encounter here. If we have some kind of combat encounter, that could cause the tunnels to collapse here. All right, so let's see what our second encounter here is. Uh, 16. Okay, uh, the room's floor has a steep slope. Scaling it with uh, without sliding down, uh, taking D3 damage, requires a DR10 strength or agility test unless you use rope or other climbing equipment. Okay, so Jambo is going to take his uh, rope. He's got this hemp rope and he will kind of tie it off. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to retrieve that. Let's see if we can retrieve that. Uh, he's going to make a probably a presence test to see if he could figure out how to tie off this, this rope and retrieve it or not in order so, so we can descend down into uh, this corridor here and maybe make our way over to point A. All right, so let's see. Uh, a two, no, so we do not know how to retrieve the rope, but he does know how to set it up. So we will cross off Jambo's hemp rope, but it did allow us to descend this steep path down and we don't have to worry about making noise. We're not going to fall and possibly cause the, uh, the, the ceiling and the tunnel to collapse. So I think we're pretty good there. Uh, we will move down here now to this next uh, point of interest. I would say that I could move three hexes or up to the next node. I think that makes sense. But now one to a six. On a one, I do have a random combat encounter. And a one. Okay, so what do we find here in the tunnels? I am going to just roll up here on the low threats for Mork Manual here. And that's another D66. A 41. We come across some kind of human, a commoner. So what is this human doing down here? Interesting. Maybe he is another explorer. Uh, let's see. Let's roll up on the chart here. To see what kind, what they are doing. Because I do get a plus three here. So hey there, buddy. I get a plus three because of my enthralling personality. That's going to be a 2d6. Uh, two, three, a six. Uh, meh, we're neutral. Okay, so the human commoner is neutral. But let's see what he's all about here. Let's see, human, human commoner, 110. That's uh, so nice when uh, books have page numbers that you that uh, that list what you're trying to find. Okay, 110. Human commoner, number appearing, there's just one, the destitute and downtrodden masses. So maybe this is somebody that got lost down here. Uh, what is their uh, personality? Uh, they're angry because they're lost. And uh, maybe we can help them. Maybe we can point them into the direction of the entrance, but then they would be lost in the Gardens of Yin. But uh, maybe the Gardens of Yin might be more appealing than the Demon Worm Tunnels. Uh, let's see what a uh, difficulty check would be in order for us to convince this angry lost commoner. Uh, we can convince them to listen to us and say, hey, you know, we, we left this rope here. You can use that to scale up. Just don't make a lot of noise. Make your way up to this point here and you can uh, at least go into the Gardens of Yen. Uh, tell the Rose Maidens that uh, Tanner and Jambo sent you. And there is, uh, let's see here, uh, that is a difficulty of a hard test. Okay, so this guy, he's pretty angry. He's probably not going to listen to us. I would say that this is a hard, is a DR16 on a presence test. So DR16 and a two. No, he doesn't listen to us. He goes, uh, he goes stomping off because he's mad, but he doesn't attack us. So that would be an example of an encounter. Now, one thing we do need to do is get better because as I progressed through time, as we finally found the demon worm tunnels, that was one of the milestones. And as you hit a milestone using the rules for solitary defilement, you do get to get better. So if we were to get better, I'm not, I'm not going to do that on camera here. But um, if we were going to get better, then we could roll up on the get better chart here. Uh, where is that? Uh, getting better on uh, 54. And so when you get better in Morkborg, uh, there aren't levels, there aren't experience, but you do have a chance of your stats going up or maybe finding some coin and uh, maybe learning or getting gaining more omens and that kind of thing. So that is how you level up in Morkborg. And I guess one, another thing we should have done is uh, progressing time is also roll up to see if we have the next omen. And so what was our omen roll now was at a D12. Okay, so if we roll a 12, then we have hit our next uh, prophecy, I should say, our next 
a prophecy of the dark lord and a two okay so no we're good every day you have to roll up to see how the prophecies uh transpire there okay so then we were at our next node here and now let's roll up our two encounters at this node here we have a 55 okay 55 let's see here 55 Seemingly empty layer, piles of bodies, all meat gnawed off the bones. After 15 minutes of searching, discover D20 plus 10 silver, uh, up to eight times. 30 minutes after entering the lair, the Kruger returns. So the Kruger is a hairless tiger with striped skin, completely covered in watery, pestilent blisters and growths. So after 30 minutes, so uh, we could harvest, we could uh, dig up some of the treasure, some of the gold. Uh, possibly I would need to roll to see if if Tanner or Jambo would have the intuition to know that this is some kind of creature's lair. Uh, if they did not, then I would say that maybe I am ambushed by the Kruger and have some kind of combat encounter like that. But let's go to point A here. We finally reach one of the possible locations of the Silver City. And on a one, we have found the Silver City. And it is a two, so we did not find the Silver City. So now we need to move back to point B and explore that, and then point C, and then finally point D to eventually find the Silver City. And then once we find the Silver City, we would continue to explore the various locations here, looking for more clues to know where our, uh, where our final MacGuffin, where the Clark's uh, bag of holding is, if it is in this palace or this palace, and I would continue to play like that. And so, yeah, that's how I would play uh, this adventure. And I am going to continue. I'm going to go back into the gardens and continue the rest of this adventure casually off camera, just kind of enjoying my time exploring the gardens of Yen. And I did want to mention a couple things. If you liked what you uh, heard from the gardens of Yen and you like that kind of style and you are possibly looking for some fiction that will maybe scratch a gardens of Yen itch. I did want to talk briefly about some books that I have, and I think that they go along really well with the Gardens of Yen. Of course, uh, the one author that definitely comes to mind is Lord Dunzani, um, Over the Hills and Far Away, or The King of Elfland's Daughter. Very cool, kind of fairy tale, poetic-like qualities to Lord Dunzani. His writing is just amazing. Uh, this, a lot of his stuff was from the early 1900s, so like 1906. But I did want to read, which, uh, the, the, the Sacred City of Krak, of Krakowlitz. And that is at 228. This is pretty cool here. Just give you an example of how, of, uh, of his writing style. So this is one of the um, Valentine adult fantasies here, edited by uh, edited by Lynn Carter. There was always something a bit wild about the odd hill of which the story tells. There were myrtle bushes dotted about it, which gave it a wild air, and shrubs of other kinds and a few large lonely rocks, and all the little things by which hills so often proclaim that, unlike the fields and gardens, they owe no allegiance to man. It was a bit wild in any case without the mirage, so that when the mirage came shining down on the top of it and putting over the myrtles, azaleas, and junipers, a little eastern city, such as could not have possibly stood within a hundred miles, then it was no wonder that a young, impressionable peasant of that far end of Europe that we call the Near East considered the hill sacred." Just a fantastic writer. If you've never read Lord Dunzani before and you like fantasy, this is kind of where a lot of it began. Uh, his writing is so good. But then we also have these other adult Valentine, adult Valentine adult fantasy volumes edited by Lynn Carter, The Young Magicians and Dragons, Elves, and Heroes. And so these contain a whole bunch of really cool stories. And another author that this uh, the the, the uh, Gardens of Yin does remind me of is some stuff like by Clark Ashton Smith, um, E. R. Edison, uh, Lord Danzani as well, and also um, Morris. I thought Morris was in here. Is Morris in this one? William Morris. Uh, William Morris is another very early writer of fantasy, and he has some really cool stuff as well. Uh, where is the William? Yeah, William Morris, The High History of the Sword Graham. 
And so if you want to read some old style um, fantasy, I definitely do also recommend William Morris. And then also this uh, series here, we have the Yearwood series by or the Finn Branch uh, trilogy, actually, by Paul Hazel. This is a really interesting trilogy. And the witch son bastard heir to kingdoms on land and under the sea, young Herwad leaves the mountains of his abandonment and sets forth on a bold quest to reclaim his birthright. Across the world of marvel and peril, he travels where crows whisper prophecy and the dead sail seas. Where the streams spawn fell dreams and the forests house ancient gods, where lustful old powers yet burn in dark hearts and a young man's road to love and kinship winds toward a greater darkness still. So we have your uh, your your wood and then uh, Undersea and Winter King. And that's the trilogy uh, by Paul Hazelwood. And then an author that this also really does remind me of is uh, Patricia McKillop and her book, The Tower at Stony Wood and The Forgotten Beasts of Eld are also really good. So if you enjoy The Gardens of Yen and you're looking for some fiction to scratch a similar itch, I do recommend Patricia McKillop and Paul Hazelwood and uh, these collections edited by Lynn Carter and uh, books by Lord Denzani. And the nice thing about Denzani is that a lot of his stuff is in public domain. And so you can download stuff for free. So, all right, you guys, well, I hope you have a great holiday week and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.